Jim, will there be a soundtrack from the, uh, the, the great documentary about Pete called The Power of Song? I believe so. Uh, right now we're just out in theaters in a very, very small way, but people have been responding to the film. We're, I think, this week in about four cities. We're coming to New York in two weeks at the IFC. The Weinstein Company is distributing it. My guess is that uh, when we go to a home video in the spring, uh, there will probably be a, a CD uh, available, and Pete's book will probably be available around that time, too. Pete, knowing, again, your your reluctance about the uh, tinselly part of the music business, I, I just want to know your feelings about having this extraordinary movie about your life. How do you When you're watching it, what are you feeling in your head? What are you feeling in your heart? Well, I'm a little embarrassed, if you want to know the truth. No, uh, Jim did a good job. Jim also did the movie about the Weavers about 25 years ago, 28 years ago. And uh, I'm only sorry that Lee Hayes isn't around still. Lee sang bass in the Weavers, and he was one of the geniuses that I knew in my life. I, uh, another was Woody Guthrie, of course, but Lee wrote the words of If I Had a Hammer and the words of Kisses Sweeter Than Wine and also wrote one of the most extraordinary poems which I'll ever know. I memorized it. It's a short poem. Uh, Lee had been run out of Arkansas by the Ku Klux Klan or he might have been lynched. He'd been teaching at an interracial school. And just before he died, I saw this poem on his piano and said, Lee, can I, can I get, make a copy of this? Oh, he says, take it. Here's the poem. If I should one day die by violence, please take this as my written will, and in the name of simple common sense, treat my destroyer only as one ill, as one who needed more than I could give, as one who never really learned to live in peace and joy and love of life but was diseased and plagued by hate and strife. My vanished life might have some meaning still when my destroyer learns to know goodwill. Oh, that's beautiful. The power of music. That's extraordinary. That's how, uh, that's how Pete and I met was Lee Hayes. I was actually a teenager in Croton, and I was Lee Hayes' gardener. And Pete would come and visit Lee, and I'd sit in the background and listen to these wonderful stories between the two of them. Uh, probably Pete's closest friend was Lee and longtime collaborator, first with the Almanac Singers and then the Weavers. It, it, it's funny you mention that, Jim, because one of the things I noticed uh, about the movie is that the, your use of color in some of those sequences is, is, is absolutely extraordinary, uh, particularly the more contemporary shots of... Uh, Pete in his uh, colorful wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's totally Pete. But um, Pete and I share a love of nature. When I'm not in editing rooms or shooting, I'm I'm out in the woods, and I would say that's true of Pete too. Uh, we both live up in the Hudson Valley, not far from one another, and. Um, uh, nature has been a big part of Pete's life. Uh, he's happiest there, I would say, and um, we tried to use that as a theme throughout the film, the changes of seasons, the, because Turn, 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 uh, as played by Roger at the Kennedy Center, was such a an apex in the movie. Um, but nature is important to Pete, and I think for a lot of reasons, partly because we're on the verge of destroying it. Absolutely. Mm. Were you conscious of putting that into your film? Or yes. Yeah, so so yeah. there's uh, no accident about those, uh, the framing of those shots no. or the colors that... Uh, they no, were. as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Pete's grandson, um, Kitama, and I worked on a lot of those things together. And because uh, uh, we lived, you know, probably 15 minutes from Pete or 20 minutes from Pete, if there was a snowstorm coming in in the dawn or uh, the leaves were changing or something like that, we would... Uh, get up early and try to be at the Hudson River as that was happening or um, climb with the cameras up into the hills where Pete hiked for many, many years near his house and overlook this beautiful Hudson Valley. Uh, I'm going to bring it back around to this a little later on in your visit. But for right now, <clears throat> I also found fascinating the contrast between the 
more contemporary color footage and then the black and white uh, archives well, footage. We were very fortunate that Pete and Toshi were filmmakers uh, and had a barn full of films. Uh, Toshi and had saved a lot of the photographs she had taken over the years. Mm. So Pete had started experimenting, what, Pete, in about 55, uh, using cameras and uh, making films? I started to earn money in, the, in 1955 and got a second-hand newsreel camera for $210. Uh, we couldn't afford color film. We used black and white film. But I made a little movie of steel drums. I flew down to Trinidad and filmed people taking oil barrels and turning them into musical instruments. And then one thing led to another, made a little film of children's finger games. And uh, our daughter, Tina, was only about one or two years old. We had finger games like, put your finger in the air, in the air, and so on. <laughs> well, that song Woody made up, come to think of it. So we, we, we had a, a wealth of material that was I had, I had been aware about for maybe 25 years, and that was up in Pete's barn, uh, and Katama and Toshi and I kind of went through it all and, and found the pieces that are in the film. The newsreel stuff? Newsreel was, uh, that was more through archival research, uh, through the various TV shows. You know, Pete was not on TV for 17 years. He had been blacklisted off commercial television in the in the United States for 17 years until he got on the Smothers Brothers show and sang Big Muddy, which was terrific. Uh, and even the first attempt of that was censored. Uh, but luckily, uh, there was Canada. <laughs> and uh, uh, actually, a, a funny thing is that the the, the producer of this film uh, is Michael Cole, who is the manager of the Rolling Stones and probably runs the largest touring company in the, in the world, uh, putting on these huge concerts. And when he was a kid... He went to a camp outside of Toronto that was a progressive camp that Pete and the Weavers would play at. And this music changed his life. And uh, Michael and I got together with another guy, Bill Eigen, and had some talks with Pete when Pete had said it was maybe this because of this political climate, it was a good time to make the movie he wanted to. We'd been talking about making this movie for about 20 years, but Pete is so self-effacing that and so uncomfortable being a celebrity that he really didn't want it made until after he was gone. And um, I think he, he felt that this was an important time to come out and take a stand and make the movie. Well, one of the things that I find true about it is you reach a certain point in your life, whatever you're doing, but particularly if it's something in the arts, something in, uh, in radio or television, where y you want to pay back the people that inspired you, that meant something to you, that carved a place out in, in your heart that will never be unoccupied. They will always be there. And embarrassing for him or not, that's certainly the case with Pete. And I think it's the reason for, for many of these honors. Pete, like the, the Appleseed recordings, it's up to three volumes now where uh, some of the most talented artists of our time are, are keeping your songs and music uh, alive. That's got to be gratifying. I'm very proud, yes. All right. uh, we got him to not admit just, <laughs> not, not that they are famous, but I'm, as I said, I'm old grandpa to not just dozens, but hundreds or even thousands of young folks say, hey, this is a fun song. I think I'm going to try singing it, and maybe I'll teach it to others. And they're not getting famous, but they're singing somewhere. You know, I think one of the beauties of, of what Pete has done is he remembered music as a part of the human condition, part of the human expression that, that you know, before electronics, we all made music as a way to sing our babies to sleep, uh, court our paramours to um, also amplify social concerns. And, and I think music for Pete was was more about that than anything else and is more about that than anything else that 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 it's a joy to make music and that music sung together by a lot of people can be a, f a political force like it was in the civil rights movement like it was in the peace movement in Vietnam 
these songs, when sung by a lot of people, give that huge chorus that Pete has. When you're in that room or that concert hall with all those people singing, there's nothing quite like it. Did you choose the title of the documentary and is what you just said the reason for it? Yes. That simple, The Power of Music, Pete Seeger, The Power of Music.